Hello and welcome back to Build a CubeSat. My name is Manuel and today we are starting our walkthrough of the schematic for my CubeSat EPS. Alright, so we are here in KiCad 8 in dark mode due to popular demand. And uh, two quick things before we get going. Um, firstly, this could be done much simpler. Um, it has become a bit complex because I want to incorporate a lot of redundancy. So at least um, dual redundancy for important parts and at least triple redundancy for critical parts. And also I would like to collect a lot of telemetry, so data about voltages, currents and temperatures. So yeah, uh, I think in future iterations where we move into a more of a um, where we're moving to flight hardware actually, this could be done a bunch simpler and I would like to simplify it at some point. Um, secondly, in the same way, and this is just, you know, the first draft of the first version. So probably there are a lot of errors and uh, stuff that could be improved. If you, if you notice something, please leave a comment. I'm always happy to hear from you all. So yeah, just, I'm also kind of new at designing electronics, so bear with me here. Let's maybe start at the inhibits, which are, I would say, one of the most important parts of the EPS. So the CubeSat design specifications mandate that the CubeSat is fully inert and the batteries are disconnected until it is deployed. Um, this is achieved uh, through two features mainly. The RBF feature, which is a pin that is uh, removed after the CubeSat has been integrated into the deployer and the deployment switches. Those are small switches that are integrated into the rails on the C plus end of the CubeSat that are depressed uh, as long as the CubeSat is inside the deployer and then released when the CubeSat leaves the deployer. You need at least two deployment switches, but you can of course have up to four, which is what I, I intend to do. So let's look at the RBF pin. Uh, physically, that's just, uh, right now, it's just a jumper on the edge of the board that gets pulled. Um, if it's applied, as long as it's applied, the RBF net is pulled to ground. And if the jumper is pulled, the RBF net is floating. Deploy 2 is actually linked to the RBF pin. So that's basically a redundancy for the RBF pin that has the same effects as if the, if the RBF pin um, were applied. Now deploy one, on the other hand, uh, goes straight to the battery load switches. Those are the devices that we're going to see in a minute that actually disconnect um, the batteries from the system. But here next to this uh, RBF pin, we just have um, jumpers to override all three of these uh, inhibits. I just wanted a way to pull any of these up or down for development. The deployment one goes into the battery pack, which is what we are going to talk about next. It is a bit cramped down here, sorry about that. Um, yeah, that's also something I, I stuck with A4 sized or le uh, leather sized sheets. It might have been wise to switch to a larger sheet size, but I wanted to be able to actually print them without scaling at some point. So yeah, it does get a bit cramped in some parts. So on the input side of the battery pack, we have a 3.3 volt supply that we are needing for, um, for sensors that are inside this um, sheet that we're going to see in a minute. The deploy one signal that goes to the enable pin and two um, temperature sensors that actually are connected to the battery charger because the battery charger would like to stop charging when the batteries are um, below zero degrees Celsius or I think above 40 degrees. So yeah, that's that. And the output of the battery pack is of course VBAT, the, you know, the power. And we also have a, um, an I squared C connection for telemetry. So if we jump into this sheet, on the top right here we have the battery pack, which consists of four LG MJ1 in a 2S 2P configuration which gives us a nominal voltage of 7.2 volts. And below this we have the temperature sensors. Um, these are the two that are coming from the battery chargers. And here we have two more for our own use because I would like to collect some telemetry about the battery temperatures as well. So the main positive lead from the batteries um, goes underneath this device. This is a um, Hall Effect current sensor. 
I tried to have an unbroken trace going from the batteries to the load switches. Because I'm a bit paranoid, I didn't want to route through a, uh, a conventional current sensor. So this device, I think, is mainly used for sensing higher currents, but I wanted to try and see if this also works for our application. I'm not sure if, the, if, if it's going to work, but it's, it's a bit of an experiment. Implementing this was super straightforward with any IC on this design. I'm, I'm basically sticking to the datasheet and the typical implementations that are usually noted there. Um, we just needed some input and output capacitance and this is the analog output voltage that correlates to the current that it senses. So the battery positive connection then continues on over here and these four things are the load switches. They are two different kinds of devices, so these up here are by Infineon and the, the, the bottom two are by Vichy. And the Infineon ones are um, quite oversized. I mean, they're super overkill for this application. I think they can each handle up to uh, 70 amps or something like that. So way too much, but they have a very low voltage drop and they seem like super robust um, components. I went with those for the moment, um, fully knowing that I may have to switch them out for something more reasonable in the future. Um, also, by the way, um, connected to this VBAT line is uh, the enable flag, which we are going to use just in a bit. It is pulled up by four individual resistors um, with the idea that three of these can fail and we still get a good pull up on this pin. Again, uh, for implementing the load switches, I basically stuck to the datasheet. There is not really much going on, just some input and output capacitance and I broke out the diagnostic pins to test points. The V-shaped parts are basically um, identical in the implementation. Input and output caps, test points, that's it. And in the end, I just connected them together, which I think should be fine because they have internal diodes. I'm about to find out soon if, if this actually works. But what, the, what we get out in the end is, is VBAT. What else do we have here? Oh yeah, there is of course an ADC. Um, this takes in the temperature sensor voltages and the current sensor voltage and puts them on the um, I squared C line. I think this is an analog devices part, the ADS 1015. It was also super straightforward and easy to implement. As with most I squared C devices, you have an address select pin. And this one gets an address of 72 if it's pulled low. This is mainly important if we have multiple identical devices on the same I squared C bus, which may actually uh, happen in this design. So below here we only have um, pin receptacles to actually connect the batteries to the main EPS PCB. And I think that's it for the battery sheet. So let's head back up. Over here we have a charging port that is pretty much just uh, straight connected to VPV, which is the um, solar cell power input net. Um, my idea here is that you don't really, we don't really need the USB-C um, charging circuitry on the EPS port because we are not going to need this in space, so it's not on, not on there. This is just, um, you know, a, a connector, a two-pin connector. Uh, where you can apply 12 volts from any source, basically. The only things I added here are a TVS diode, so that's a transient voltage suppression diode that protects the rest of the circuit from um, electrostatic discharge, and a Schottky diode to um, protect from reverse polarity. So I think this is it for this corner of the sheet. So let's maybe talk next about the LDOs. So LDO stands for Low Dropout Regulator. That's basically a kind of um, buck regulator that works with a, an input voltage that is only minimally above its output voltage. How big this difference has to be um, is different for each part, but the thing is that they are very easy to implement and kind of reliable, but not too efficient. I am using LDOs here as a um, basically a, a pulse, a signal for the whole system to start booting up. So 
um, what the RBF and Deploy2 do is they pull enable LDO down when they are applied. But as soon as they are released and enable LDO is floating and the batteries are connected, enable LDO is pulled up through these uh, three resistors, again for redundancy, and goes into this sheet. On the output side of this sheet, we get 3.3 volts auxiliary out. This in turn pulls up enable system through these resistors here. And enable system is basically the system-wide signal to start booting. Also on the output side here, we have another pair of I2C connections. So if we jump into this sheet here, um, this may look like a lot, but it's actually kind of simple. It's just a lot of repetition for the redundancy. On the top, we have our LDOs. So this section here is LDO1, this is LDO2, and this is LDO3. You will notice that LDO1 actually consists of two individual um, ICs. This is an analog devices part, I think, the LT3045. And I have paralleled this just according to the datasheet to get double the um, output current from it. So usually it can supply up to 500 milliamps, and with two of them we get up to one amp which we are probably not going to need, but um, you know, it, it, it can't hurt, I thought. Also, again, for redundancy, one of, one of those can just uh, stop working and we still have some current available here. These were surprisingly simple to um, implement here. The other LDOs are very similar. This, these are STM parts, I think, yeah the STM LDO for the LPU. So a very similar story here, input and output caps, the enable pin is normally pulled up and the output is just 3.3 volts. So now we have three individual 3.3 volt outputs. So what do we do with these now if we want to achieve some degree of redundancy? This is where this section comes uh, into play, which um, looks a bit overcrowded as well, if you ask me but it's actually not too complicated. So what we have here are four um, O-ring controllers. So these are basically ideal diodes. Um, these two over here are maximum integrated parts and these over here that have two inputs each are um, analog devices parts. This LTC4415 is a very interesting part in my opinion because we get um, two inputs and two outputs, and we get to switch manually between the two. Also, we have built-in current monitoring and current limiting, and we get some um, status signals for the output. So that's kind of a lot in a smallish package. So what I would like to achieve here is that by default, um, LDO1 should be used. That's the that's the LDO that supplies the most current, and I think the LT3045 is a pretty robust and reliable part. So this is the one that I would like to use primarily. I connected LDO1 to the first input on each of these, and then LDO2 and 3 on the second input, respectively. So if LDO1 stops working, this should automatically switch over to LDO2 or 3. Yeah, that's basically what I wanted to achieve here. All of these um, inputs and outputs are connected to this GPIO expander. This is a text instrument part, the TCAL 9539. If you haven't come across one of those before, it's basically just a bunch of inputs and outputs that are then uh, supplied to an I2C bus. It, the nice thing here is that we can also pull each input up or down through internal 10k resistors. So this will come in really handy for controlling things. So suppose you want to manually turn on or off one of the LDO inputs. We have these enable pins here. And these are just hooked up straight to the GPIO expander and can be pulled up or down. Um, also, of course, all the status outputs and the warning outputs are connected straight to the um, GPIO expander and can then be read through a microcontroller. Another thing I did here, because four of the pins are actually not being used, is I connected these global flags to them. It's a bit of a hack, but I would like to use them for another um, or in controller in another part of the sheet. So that's how I solve this. 
apart from that, uh, again, implementing the this GPIO expander was super straightforward. All we need are a few um, pull-up capacity uh, pull-up resistors here for the I squared C lines, and also there is a reset for this device itself, so we can actually reboot it without power cycling it. And there is an interrupt that we could use on a microcontroller. Um, here again, we have um, address selection pins. Um, by the way, if you have never um, really worked with one of those, it is very different from, from device to device, what address it will get depending on which pin is pulled high or low or floating. That's information we'll find in the data sheet. For this part, for example, if both address pins are low, it gets an address of decimal 116 or hex um, 74. Below the GPIO expander, we have an ADC that takes in the um, current measurements from these O-ring controllers here and also puts them on the I squared C line. The only thing remaining is a temperature sensor because, um, you, well, the LDOs aren't super efficient, as we mentioned, and they shed a lot of heat. So we need to kind of keep an eye on their temperature. And this is the PCT2075 that I have also used in the breadboard prototype for the EPS which uh, just, well, you know, work just fine. You just basically hook it up to um, I squared C, apply some pull-up resistors, uh, an input cap. And in this case, the address selection, for the address selection, I just left all three pins unconnected, which gives it an address of 27. I think this is it for the LDO line. So again, what we get out of this, um, as soon as the LDOs are enabled, is a 3.3 volt power supply that we can use on the EPS and also elsewhere on the system. My thinking here is that this is for bootstrapping the system on one hand and for backup power on the other hand. So the main power supply will be switching voltage regulators because they are just that much more efficient, but they're also harder to implement. So I'm using this 3.3 volt output along with the enable system flag to then tell a um, avionics microcontroller to run some diagnostics and if everything seems good to actually enable the switching voltage regulators which are much more efficient. So because they are much more efficient we would also like to use their output to run the stuff on the EPS itself. If we don't need to use the LDOs um, I would like to avoid using them too much because of their inefficiency. To switch the power for the EPS itself, we have this sheet here. So it takes in the 3.3 volts from the LDOs and from the switching regulators, along with, if needed, manual overrides, and then um, puts out the right 3.3 the right volts. Looking at this, it probably seems familiar. These are again the two Maxim ideal diodes and the analog devices uh, or in controller. I have connected the switching voltage regulators 3.3 um, volts to these two and the LDO to the first input here. So by default it will use the LDO power supply to um, power up the avionics microcontroller. But if this microcontroller then decides that everything seems normal and we should switch to the switching voltage regulators, these two pins get pulled low and power comes, comes from here. And here we meet these four global flags again that are going to the um, ADC I showed you before on the other sheet. So okay, let's head back to the main sheet. Maybe this is even a good moment to break for today because I think this video is already getting kind of long. So this is all I have for today. Um, as you may know, I'm not an electrical engineer and I'm in fact pretty new at this. So if you have any ideas or thoughts, then please leave a comment. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next episode when we continue this walkthrough of the EPS schematic.